Good evening. Welcome. This meeting of the Tom Belasti Board of Trustees called to order at 532. Uh, for the record, a quorum is present. Uh, Justin Unser cannot be here tonight. This meeting is being held in is being recorded in accordance with Government Code Section 551.128. We will now turn the meeting over to Superintendent Dr. Martha Salazar Zamora to proceed with recognitions. Thank you so much, President McLeod, board members, those of you in the audience. We are so excited to recognize two groups this evening. We will start with our Tomball ISD school counselors. This is school counselor recognition week and to begin the recognitions we have our very own Dr. Michael Webb our chief academic officer who will begin the recognitions. Dr. Thank Webb. You. President McLeod, Dr. Zamora, members of the board, please join me this evening in celebrating our Tomball ISD counselors in honor of National School Counselor Week. School counselors play a crucial role in the lives of students providing them with support guidance and the resources they need to succeed. They are children's advocates, their confidants, their champions, helping them navigate the complex challenges of adolescence in order to prepare for a bright future. This week, we take a few moments to reflect on the incredible work that they do and to recognize the dedication and commitment they bring to our students every single day. Whether they are providing individual counseling, leading small groups, working with teachers and families, or providing guidance in course and program selection, they are making a real and lasting impact on the lives of students in Tomball. So let us take this opportunity to celebrate their achievements, support their efforts, and to recommit to the important work that lies ahead in ensuring every student is ready for college, career, and the military. It is only through our collective efforts that we can create safe and supportive environments where every student can reach their full potential. Here are just a few accomplishments of the counseling team in the last 12 months. High school counselors increased the amount of scholarships received by our three graduating classes by 20%. Last year's total scholarships earned by Tumball ISD seniors was over $26 million. Junior high and high school counselors led the charge of recruitment of students into our CTE pathways. Last year, 1,042 Tomball ISD students received an industry-based certification, in part because of the work of our counselors. To date, counselors have conducted over 191 suicidal risk assessments. Counselors have identified and referred 48 students at risk of not graduating to Success Academy in the last four months alone. Counselors were also responsible for connecting over 300 students in the past six months to our wraparound services, helping them address their mental wellness and substance abuse challenges. Thank you to all the counselors for your tireless efforts and for the difference you make in the lives of students every day. Happy School Counselor Week. Now, for a proper recognition, please come to the front of the room when your name is called. With us this evening, we have Kara Agundes, Creekview Elementary. Brenda Becerril, Canyon Point Elementary. Mark Floyd, Tomball Memorial High School. Sherry Forsyth, Tomball Memorial High School. Shannon Gutierrez, Tomball Intermediate. Brandy Halverson, Creekside Park Junior High. Karen Hill, Tomball High School. Nizer Diaz Vela, North Point Intermediate. Angela Howe, Tomball High School. Alfred Jones, Tomball Memorial High School. Sandra Makush, Grand Lakes Junior High. Emily Nichols, Tomball High School. Lachelle Nix, 
Tallbaugh Memorial High School, Lauren Heinrich, Wildwood Elementary, Stephanie Robinette, Grand Oak Elementary, Monica Starvokic, Decker, uh, Decker Prairie Elementary. <laughs> Trying to get the Sterovich and the Decker in there. It's like a delicate dance. Aaron Timlets. Timber Creek Elementary. Amy Van. Tomball High School. Erica Zeno. Tomball Memorial High School. Larissa Kaminsky. Tomball Elementary High School, Tomball Elementary, and I think we did not miss one okay. single counselor to come in late. I think we're good. And of course, for our fantastic leader of school counseling in Tomball ISD, Mr. Stephen Shields. Ladies and gentlemen, the work that you do is incredible, and you are thanked not just this week, but every single week. Thank you again to our amazing counselors. Next, we are so excited to have Tomball High School football team. It looks like pretty much everyone is here. Coach, I'm excited to hear from our athletic director, Kevin Flanagan, who will share the many accolades from these young men. I'm so excited. I know there's a recent one that I hope you mention as well the academic recognition. Absolutely. All righty, take it away, Coach. Mr. McLeod, Dr. Zamora, members of the board, thank you for having us here this evening. And this truly is probably one of the best nights uh, of my career. Get to recognize a group that I will say uh, I'm super, super proud of, um, not only of their athletic accomplishments, but also as we'll talk about, and I know Coach will go into uh, their academic uh, prowess also. But I will say this, in 32 years of coaching, probably the best job of coaching that I've ever seen uh, was by our coaching staff this past year and the job they did with these young men. And these young men very easily uh, coming off a season that was historic, 
Tomball history and losing a lot of seniors, there was a lot of people that doubted this group and doubted uh, what they would do. And they never stepped back. They never doubted. They believed in their coaches. They believed in the process. And uh, they performed and made all of us extremely proud. And um, so as Coach Handel is coming up, I also want to mention, in addition to that, they are also the National Football Federation Academic Excellence representative for the state of Texas, wow. the lone wow. finalist in 6A in the entire state of Texas. Uh, for that award. Wow. And there are many things that go into that, but just to simplify it, the overall varsity GPA was a 3.8 GPA this year oh my overall. So With that, I could keep going on and on and on, but I wanted to turn it over to Tomball High School Campus Athletic Coordinator and Head Football Coach to announce all of these guys. Our right, guys, come on up. <clears throat> yes, stand up, yeah. <laughs> Give her. All right, I'll stand up there, face Dr. Zamora on the board. This way. <laughs> we actually had a walkthrough of this this morning during the athletic period, so hopefully we get this right. <laughs> They're doing good. <laughs> Mr. McLeod and the rest of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Zamora and your entire cabinet, and then of course Coach Flan, uh, thank you so much for, for allowing us to be here. Uh, more importantly, thank you so much for all that you do for us in athletics and, and for your support. Uh, without all of that, we, we would not be standing here today. So, um, Ladies and gentlemen, standing before you today are the 2022 by district champs, area champs, regional semifinalists. And more importantly, like Coach Flan alluded to, the National High School Academic Excellence Award National Finalist. These guys were the lone 6A finalists in the state of Texas. They are still one out of 60 schools in the nation still in the running for the Hatchell Trophy. Most importantly, these young men taught me, Tomball High School, the entire Tomball community, and the entire state of Texas what resiliency looks like. They did it each and every week. Uh, like Coach Flan alluded to, it was supposed to be a rebuild season after, after everything that, that we lost as far as uh, the number of guys from the roster last year. They, want, they wanted no part of that whatsoever. Um, resiliency in everything they do, in everything they modeled, in everything that how they conducted themselves, uh, going from losing a beloved teammate before the season by going through a coaching change, by starting the season 0-2, and, and by coming back in four ball games, most importantly the second round playoff game being down 13-3 to with less than five minutes and finding a way to win. Every, everything these guys do, uh, they never <coughs> flinch. And again, they, they taught me and so many others uh, what resiliency looks like, and for that, I'll, I'll forever be grateful. Um, again, so proud of these guys. They're, they're going to go on to, to do great things um, and represent Tomball High School, the Tomball community, in, in such a positive way that uh, thank you is not enough to this group of, of young men. Uh, but again, guys, thank you. We'll never forget the memories. Uh, more importantly, the relationships that we have will, will last forever. So, ladies and gentlemen, the 2022 Tomball Cougar football team. Congratulations. 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 Congratul
Thank you, gentlemen. Congrats again on all of your many accomplishments on the field and in the classroom. Okay. This is the time if anybody would like to exit, otherwise known as escape, um, you might want to do that. We will move on with our reports for the evening. The first report is the annual accountability report. Mr. Mark White, our Assistant Superintendent of Accountability, will present, and I believe we will also have some information from Dr. Michael Webb, our Chief Academic Officer, around the state of accountability in the state of Texas. Much to discuss. <laughs> All right. Uh, President McLeod, Dr. Salazar Zamora, members of the board and guests. It is my annual privilege to bring to you the annual report. It is a compilation report of several other pieces of information that you have seen as they were promptly released. Um, however, the, we are required to have a public meeting around the compilation report, um, which will be published following this, following this tomorrow's meeting, actually. Um, so let me make sure. So the content of the report does include the Texas Academic Performance Reports or the TAPER reports. There is a little bit of additional information in those reports which does not appear inside of our accountability reports because it doesn't go into the actual accountability grade. Things like class size averages, um, the number of students per counselor or, or student load per counselor, et cetera. Those are things that the state does track. However, it doesn't affect our particular grade. So there is some, some additional information in the taper reports which exists for the district as well as for each campus. The district accreditation status, this is the second year in a row. Reminding you that this report is for, the, is for last school year. And so last school year, there was a suspension of accreditation status for a second year in a row, which will, be, which will return this year due to um, the lack of an accountability rating issued for the, uh, for the, prior, for the school year prior to that. Um, there are special education compliance status, uh, a series of discipline reports. Those same discipline reports were the ones that we incorporated into the district improvement plan and at the <coughs> campus level in each of the CIPs, which you approved in October. They also, they, those discipline reports also include the school violence prevention policies. It's a listing of your board policies, which address particular um, statutes that, that have to be 
that have to appear inside of the annual report. The TPIR reports are, are not reports that go into our accountability reports. Those are um, high school to college transition reports, which mostly we, and TPIR is a, a, a partnership with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, and that's how we track matriculation. What happens with our students <laughs> after they leave us? How many of them show up the next year? How many of them are in four-year colleges, two-year colleges? What happened to them after a year of college, et cetera? And you'll find that series of reports available. Um, and then we have the board goals, and we'll walk through those in just a moment. There's some interesting things about that I do want to prepare you for. The series of PEAMS financial reports, I know that when our finance department pr brings you the budget reports or our, our, our um, balance reports, they're not always in PEAMS language. Um, typically, they're in more, presented more graphically. However, the PEAMS financial reports are the ones that have to appear in this particular uh, compilation. And then finally, um, there's a glossary in the back that there's a lot of acronyms that are used in the taper reports. I get lost in that language sometimes as well. And, but the glossary does include what each and every one of those metrics is and, a, and very often also includes the methodology that the state used to come up with particular ratings. Um, those taper reports are found for the district and the campuses starting on page 25, and they go all the way to page 473. By, by far, that's the greatest portion of the annual report, and that glossary of which I spoke begins on page 599, and that's in the back of the report. Um, that statement of accreditation is on page 491, and again, that's a statement from, the, from TEA, from the commissioner, explaining why there wasn't an actual rating for the 21-22 for the school year. The discipline reports and policies um, appear um, following that uh, accreditation statement on page 497. And that policy alignment from our board policies to the statute appears on page five, 505. Um, we monitor that every year along with um, Karen Graves as well to make sure that uh, we stay on top of uh, our alignment piece. Those um, matriculation reports begin on page 507. And the board goals. All right, the board goals, um, I don't know what to tell you about them, actually. The board goals are different. Are there, they are not the goals from our DIP. The board goals were part of House Bill 3, and it was trying to make sure that each and every school district had goals set up for performance by the end of third grade. We start our testing, our start testing in third grade, but part of that AYP waiver that we have um, uh, requires us to have, since we do not test at first and second grade, we, um, in lieu of that, we had to have goals set up for the third grade so that we would have some longitudinal alignment from the early childhood to make sure that we were meeting standards by third grade. Um, likewise, at the far end of that, after we stop testing um, with the EOCs, three of the five which happen in ninth grade, um, since we don't do more testing uh, in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, there are CCMR goals, which the high schools have to build out. So those are kind of the two far ends uh, where we don't do state testing. We have to develop board goals. All right, when those board goals came out, they were aligned to some particular targets in the closing the gaps section of state accountability. And Tomball met, we had already surpassed all of the state targets. So what we did was say, all right, we still have to build goals moving forward despite the fact we had met the state targets. And we set a goal of just trying to improve our ratings by 1% each year. Mind you, this started, this was 2018-19 when we set those goals and what happened in 2020 and 21. Immediately we went into two years where although we were taking tests in 2021, um, there was not an accountability rating. And so we went into a, a, a suspension of that test mode. However, we, we did not get any guidance, no one got any guidance from the state on what to do with the board goals. So we just left them the way we adopted them. Um, you know, of course, that we had some slide during those years. And so we didn't go up 
by 1% every one of those years. And we thought that's okay, it doesn't affect our accountability rating, but it does make sure that we have a benchmark of where we were and where we're trying to get back to. Um, now in the meantime, we've also gone back, and I think that Dr. Webb will share with you in a moment some more information about the STAR redesign, and also there will be a, a refresh to our current accountability system, which will go into effect this year. We still don't have any guidance on what to do with the board goals, and so we're sitting, on, sitting tight on them. We're not changing the ones that we originally adopted. If we get some different guidance, we'll come back to you um, to talk about that. However, re, um, presenting to you where we are on those board goals is a requirement for the annual report and for the presentation. Um, those PIMS and financial standards reports of which we spoke, they, they are divided into itemized uh, by budget category for the district um, on page 539, followed by each and every campus. And then there's a series of financial reports. Um, the, again, the, the information in those reports, maybe not the details campus by campus, have been previously presented to you. I am going to turn this over to Dr. Webb, and then we'll be back for questions. Thank you. Over the past 40 years, the state of Texas has had a state testing system. Each era of state testing has been represented by a specific name of an assessment. Uh, from TABS to TEAMS, uh, uh, TOS to TAX uh, to STAR. In fact, when I was a young boy in Texas schools, I took the TABS test. That TABS test was in the multiple choice format. As a young boy, I took the TEAMS, and in high school, I took the TOS test. That, those tests also were in a multiple choice format. Many of us in this room uh, can recall administering the uh, tax test in the early 2000s. That test was also in a multiple choice format. Last year, every single student in Tomball ISD and every single student in the state of Texas who took a STAR test took that test in a multiple choice format. In 2019, with the legislative session, House Bill 3906 required Texas Education Agency uh, uh, to transform substantially the format of the STAR test. And what we have this spring is called the STAR redesign. It represents a new generation in state testing in a format that we have never seen before. House Bill 3906 required 70, only a cap of 75% of the weight of this test can come from multiple choice formatted questions. The remainder of this test will come in what are called new item types, and I'll give you an example of each of those. So no different from tabs to teams, teams to toss, tax, or star, each generation of assessment represents an increase in the rigor of the expectations uh, that are set forth through, this, through the state um, assessment. 3906 requires this state assessment to be completely online. It also requires uh, depth and breadth of reading, of writing assessment on the reading language arts uh, test in grades three through English one and English two. And I'll give you some examples of that in just a moment. This is the first time also that we will be introducing a new era of assessment with a brand new accountability system, still within the framework of A through F, but thresholds, thresholds will be changed. How we, how we determine, how the state determines student growth will be different. And like Mr. White mentioned, we still do not know the framework of the refresh of A through F. Um, likely, uh, the timeline that we have been given is currently right now, our kids in Tomball ISD are seeing new item types in the STAR interim assessment in preparation for the test this spring. Uh, we will administer uh, the STAR redesigned uh, like every other district across the state in April. We will receive our multiple choice results back in May. However, it is projected we will not receive final results until the end of June or the 1st of July. New information that we have received from TEA says that we could expect uh, the accountability refresh, so our accountability rating probably around October, which would put the accountability taper report, it would push it off until January 2004. So to give you an example or uh, to give you, you know, a flavor of, of how 
substantial the change in this test is, I want to show you a simple multiple choice item test that uh, students in Tom Ball have been taking for the past 40 years. So this is a math question, some background information, a table, and then again the answers are you select uh, from the answers chosen, F, G, H, G, one choice is the correct choice, and, and then that, that represented 100% of the assessment. So another multiple choice here, uh, Nicole had a collection of 60 stuffed animals, she gave a few away, how many does she have, and have, how, how can you represent that in, um, uh, through a graph, and again, the student would have to identify the correct graph uh, in a multiple choice uh, format. This is what we've been familiar with for the past 40 years. Indeed, this is what I took when I was in um, elementary school uh, with the TABS test. No change whatsoever in the format of the test. Much different in rigor. So here is a new item type called text entry. Student baked four items, uh, uh, four times as many chocolate chip cook, uh, cookies, baked chocolate chip ch bake the, uh, the um, cookies. The question is, write an equation that can be used to find the number of vanilla cupcakes. The student ate, the student produced. This is a text entry. There is no multiple choice choices to choose from. This, the student taking this test must enter the correct uh, symbols and the correct number to get the, uh, to, um, to provide uh, the question to the answer that has been asked. This is another example of a text um, entry. A right rectangular prism has the dimensions shown. Of course, this is a very similar in how a question was asked in the last 40 years. The response, however, it will be different. This is the response. What is the volume of the prism in cubic, um, um, cubic inches? Again, the student is not going to be able to identify, uh, uh, eliminate items that may not be correct. Uh, is going to have to identify and recall the correct answer for any text entry. You'll see text entry, this format of assessment, or this format of response in reading language arts. You'll see it in math, you'll see it in science, and you also see it in social studies. Michael, just so I get the context, mm -hmm. could, could you just step back? Mm -hmm. So enter the answer in the space provided. Are you looking for, is, is the test seeking the absolute answer? Or yes. is the test seeking what the equation is? The to test will the it, it'll be an absolute answer. There'll be some. Okay. You know, it's not going to take off if there is a space added or if there's a period. Uh, but yes, it's, it's essentially we'll be looking for the exact answer. Okay. Um, okay. The reason give I give or take spaces that might have been typed in by the student. Okay. On your previous example, mm -hmm. it sounded to me like you needed to uh, complete the equation. In this example, you need to complete the equation. In the second example, you need to answer the specific. So, so it's both. It's both, and many other too. So okay. text, text entry just isn't the correct <coughs> equation or the correct response. Text entry is just a form of, of uh, question type that does not provide any multiple choice stems at all. So in our classroom, not that I'm advocating that we teach to the test, but as part of our process educating our students as to look at what the, what the problem is asking and do I answer the answer, do I put in the equation, do I, how do I handle the other 25% of what has traditionally been multiple choice? These new item types are how teachers ask questions in the classroom. Okay. Very few teachers ever asked a question and then gave you multiple choice, and that's, that's, okay. that's not how we So we're already, we're already well prepared. We are prepared for this. This is taking assessment and matching it much more closer to instructional practices and questioning that our teachers have of students in the classroom. We're in favor of, of these type of questions. Um, this is called a matched table grid. So again, uh, prompt is similar to what you would see in multiple choice um, in a uh, formatted test. The difference is, is that the student will have to then recreate or create the histogram or the bar graph by clicking on the number of schools and would have to recreate electronically, so remember this is an online test, would be creating the bar graph um, based on the X and the Y axis. So a little bit different from text entry, but the requirement is to match the table grid. Hey, Dr. Webb, mm -hmm. go, hold on. I'm gonna, 
Hey, can you go back a few slides to that first question about the equation? That one right mm -hmm. there. So the kids who, I know the kids who have uh, text, text anxiety, uh, I'm, I'm kind of one of those people. And so if I looked at that, just like right now, I might say, screw it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over that. So the kids who have those issues like me, they're already, pre they're already prepped, ready to go. They're not going to freak out with that type of questioning. They're going to, they, are they going, we might have some prop. some kids might have a problem doing that. Right. So number one, we transitioned to an online assessment three years ago. Number two, students are seeing these new item types in their unit assessments and their district benchmarks that we create as a district. And number three, again, this is simply how we teach in the classroom. We ask these type of questions, these open-ended questions that require analysis. But you're correct. It represents a substantial increase in the rigor of the assessment, but it does match more precisely, precisely to what we're doing instructionally. And our developed assessments by, by the district already are giving students these type of questions. Okay, that's, mm -hmm. I, know, I know I hear all the time my kids, my kids, you know, they don't freak out over it, but they know other kids who just stress over this and, you know, the format might be a change, but if you're already doing a classroom, that I feel some, maybe a little bit better. Yeah, they will be it. familiar with this. Part of why we did move to online before it was required was because of this, to give students the opportunity to become accustomed to it versus perhaps some districts who have waited to now a redesign test and everything online. Not to say it will make it easier for every child, but we're giving them that opportunity. Once we could, we did. Um, I personally asked the commissioner in front of a very large audience recently if it was all going to be online for the entire state and would we have challenges with that. And I was assured that we are prepared as a state and that there would be no challenges. Yeah. So, so there's no there, there's no analog. There's no paper option. No, it's none. third grade on up. We're on the computer. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Correct. But but we're okay with that or no? We are. Yes, we've, we've been, been doing, doing that, that for years. Right. Yeah, we're prepared. We've been prepared. How do our administrators feel about it? Raise your hand, or let's take a multiple choice. Why don't we? <laughs> Is the star redesign because someone's bored? That's a. Raise your hand. The takers? Is, is the star redesigned because they don't think there's enough rigor? Is that B? That's a B. Anybody going to raise their hand to that? Is it C, someone wants Mark White to pull his hair out? <laughs> there we go. So part of the star redesign, in part, is a response to the narrative uh, over the past many years of teaching to the test. So teaching to the test meant teaching, uh, uh, test-taking skills. The test has always represented the curriculum. So teaching the test means you're teaching the curriculum. So I don't believe that's what the narrative meant. The narrative meant drill and kill on multiple choice test-taking strategies. That narrative will not hold as strong with this type of assessment. This is an authentic assessment that matches how we question students in the classroom. So yeah, 75% of the weight of the test will be from multiple choice. Doesn't mean 75% of the test is multiple choice. Could mean less. Right. Uh, but the weight of the test uh, will still be attributed to multiple choice. But I think that the narrative of teaching to the test doesn't ring as true with the STAR redesign as it has for the last five generations of assessment. Do students who have, because I had a child that she had 504s and she couldn't take tests from a computer, are there? Now, there are many Exceptions. more accessibility features embedded into this test. So uh, text-to-speech, uh, 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 content clarification for students with disabilities. So if it says the grass is greener on the other side of the road, then it would provide the accommodation so the student would be able to understand that metaphor. And it would say the grass is, or the grass is not better. Or, so, you know, it, it would take those type of metaphors and give a more simplified description of, of what's being asked. The font of the test can be changed. Highlighting can be um, added. There are uh, multiple accessibility tools, but there's not a paper option. What's, what's the general feedback from, from the educators in the classroom? Is there, is there any feedback? Yes. I think that there's, I think that uh, one, 
the amount of riding. So in a slide I'll go over, over in just a minute, star, our past star, we assessed riding in grades four and seven. That's it. This new assessment, riding will be embedded in every single reading language arts assessment from grades three up. There has been a lot of teaching of teachers on how to embed writing, uh, writing in the reading assessment, in, in reading. There's been a lot of work with teachers on cross content, um, cross content instruction as well. So I'll show you an example of how this new test, this new, re this new reading test will be assessing social study standards. So that requires our social study PLCs or departments to work with our reading departments and not in silos. Because how well you answer a reading test, an item on a reading test, is going to be very much based on the background that you have in social studies or in science. There's writing that's going to be required in math. And I'll show you some of the examples that go across the content areas that it will require us to become more collaborative across the content areas. And it's going to require us to write, write, write. You know, that's the most authentic assessment that we have is writing. I don't think it is difficult for teachers, even the assessment, how we teach the rubric to assess writing responses has been substantial over the past six to eight months. But I believe if we're going to that next error, which each test represents, writing across the content areas and embedded in every single grade level test for reading, I believe that's where we want. That's the push and rigor that we want. That's producing kids that can tackle real world problems once they leave us in high school. Mm -hmm. I think that, again, that narrative of, te of teach to the test to answer, a to answer a multiple choice item, it doesn't carry as much weight anymore. But it is an increase in rigor. Will they get to have like a scratch pe piece yes, of paper? Yes, there will be scratch pizza. paper. They'll have scratch paper on the uh, uh, online as well. Um, and there are many more accessibility features. I didn't prepare all the accommodations, but there are many more accommodations to make it more accessible to a wide range of students than the paper format the test did. Yes. So this, I'm, sorry, just, is it, I'm just in my mind trying to get, trying to think through a third grader on a laptop, and I know they've been on laptops, but uh, the training provided to educators I saw in one of the bulletin updates, maybe in Kim McKinney's, maybe in Sarah Rush's, that there's just training that's provided, at least the district makes available training. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so again, we've, we've been, we're in our third year of online assessment, so students have had a lot of exposure to keyboarding. You look at all of our raising, blend, raising uh, blended learners grant schools with blended learning. All of them are, are very familiar with devices. Um, responding through a device that does not mean that we solely want students to respond to a device but to prepare a student for what is needed after high school is to prepare a student to respond in multiple ways authentic writing response through devices oral presentation uh, but I feel very comfortable I don't think that we're where we need to be I think we are much more comfortable than other districts because kids have been given a lot of exposure to device responses. I don't think that we're there yet. I don't think that we'll ever get there yet, but we are giving that exposure and that instruction so kids can have, they understand how to respond on a device. Hmm. These examples, uh, if we switch back to reading, these are simple multiple choice questions that you've seen on state, on state assessments since the beginning of state assessments. Very. A common type of assessment. What does the word assume mean in line 32? The student will go back to a passage, find 32, look at the context clues, pick the right answer. You'll see qu questions uh, that are called short constructed responses. This is not fill in the blank. If you look down here, this is a character limit of 475 characters that a student can respond with. So now you see based on paragraph 7 of the article, why does, the, why does the wood rat use the cola cactus to build its nest? Support your answer with evidence from the article. That is much more rigorous than going back to line 32 and tell me what assume means. That is significantly different. Short constructed responses, this is a reading example. Your short constructed responses will be seen on social studies and science as well. 
So the grading of this exam, I mean, are they hiring a ton of, you know, proctors that are going to be reviewing? I, I mean, I don't, it just seems like an enormous lift, right, on the assessment of the reading or the writing, I'm sorry, of our So that's, that's one reason that in the timeline we won't have our results back at the same time that we typically have them back. But yes, there will be um, assessors that will be looking at the short constructive responses. Um, and then over time, the information that we're given is that artificial intelligence would assess the short constructive responses. Like chat well, GBT or whatever they're called? <laughs> like so that? the information that we've been, we, we've been given, there'd be a human, there'd be a human and artificial intelligence would assess the same assessment. And then if, if there's difference between the two, then it goes to a human. Wow. That's the timeline we have been given. Wow. Hey, Dr. Webb, I'm going to use assume again. Uh, so I'm going to assume that all the proctors who are judging or grading the, these um, answers are all going to be have some kind of baseline to go off of. So we don't have the same kid who writes it one way, one proctor does, gives it a, a 10 out of 10, and the next one gives it a 7 out of 7. Are they going to have some type of training for all these people to say, hey, this is a 10, this is a 7, this is a 2? To where everybody's fairly equal um, in their proctoring or judging or grading of these responses? The proctors will be using the same rubrics that we've been using since October. So the rubrics for this type of response were just released so there can be consistency among the evaluators, teachers included, plus who, whomever is assessing the state test, but we will, we're all using the same rubric. Explain rubric. Just again, remind. I, I think rubric, I always think of like an equation of different variables that are all fed in to give me an answer. A rubric might have me? six or seven different yes. elements on the construction of the response. Yeah. You know, are we are we talking about sequence? We have climax. So, uh, how well have we described the character? What's the reasoning? And then there would be, you know, for each each marker, there'd be a one, two, three, or four, if you will. Yeah. And then you get a total response a total number out of the rubric. Gotcha. But based on what you're saying, one, one item in that rubric is probably going to be grammar or punctuation, right? I mean, that's the cross content type thing. Everybody, just because you're writing a, a, an answer for a math problem, you're still going to be graded on grammatical construction or punctuation or capitalization, whatever, right? to a degree. So does, and there's a different response item for spelling and grammar that we'll get to in just a minute. So, you know, a student that has some misspelling still could do well on a short constructed response if it doesn't interfere with the meaning of what's being expressed. Okay. If the grammar and the spelling is to such a degree you can't understand, then is gonna, the student would be penalized on the rubric. But I'll show you in just a minute a different type of response that will look at spelling, which is different than we've seen before too. So this is called a multi-select. Which groups are most likely the intended audience of the article? Select the correct answer in each row. So the student would have to understand first what's being asked and then analyze each of these group responses and then indicate who's the intended um, audience and who is not. Some of a multi-select multi would say select two, select three. Um, they're not all the same. So it's not all, only just select one in the intended audience and one not in the intended audience. Um, could be more than one. Um, you'll see this type of question uh, formatted again in science and social studies as well. Um, and not just this type of response, but this will be the format of what's called that multi-select. Multi and we'll see that in that 25% of the test. It's not multiple choice. Hmm. This is the spelling one. Uh, grammar could also be assessed this way. This is called an inline response. So here we're simply asking the student to identify the misspelled word or to spell it correctly. Um, and then the student would, this would be a drop down, if you will, and historical would have to be, and would have to be selected. The second version of historical would be counted incorrect. Um, it's a varied response of a multiple choice, but called inline response. But it wouldn't be considered multiple choice, even though there will be answers provided. There will be answers provided on this, yes. Okay. This is not a short answer. 
where they would have to recall it themselves. There may be some short answer, then that would go back to that first example, text entry. Text entry is more of a short answer. So here's the question uh, that I believe was asked before. So in the past, we've had fourth and seventh grade uh, writing prompts. A typical prompt would be Thomas um, Edison is a famous for inventing many things, including the light bulb. Uh, so we've given the students some background knowledge. Uh, we want them to think about some, event some inventions that they think would be useful. Then we give them a set of directions, and then they form a response. This is, this is typical. Uh, from star to tax to toss on grades four and seven. This is a fourth grade writing prompt that I just showed you on the past star. On star redesign, you'll have what's called an extended constructed response. This will be in all grade levels. So remember, there's no writing test in fourth and seventh grade. But we will have extended construction responses on every single reading test in all levels. The student must respond, however, from evidence from the text that they have just read. So in the past, we just gave them a broad prompt uh, to inform their background knowledge, likely in something that they would know, uh, write about inventions, right? It was that broad. But if you look at this one, it's read the play, the spelling test. Based on the information in the play, write a response to the following. Explain how Herbie's behavior changes and how this is developed by the playwright. So again, this is cross-curriculum. We can't expect the student to be able to respond to Herbie's behavioral changes unless they have comprehension of what they've just read. So it's not going to be based on what they bring into the testing environment. It's going to be based on how they analyze a text and then respond. This is a fourth grade idol. So are they adjusting time for this, or is it going to be the same amount of time? It'll be the same amount of time. So this is an example, I believe, that this question was asked before, too, and I, I kind of tried to allude to cross-curriculum. So how are we helping teachers prepare and students be able to be well-positioned to take this type of assessment? And it, 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 back it up from assessment all the way back to planning. So reading teams will have to plan with social studies teams. Often that's the same teacher, but as kids get older, that could be departmentalized. This is an example of a fourth grade reading prompt. This fourth grade reading prompt, as you see, uh, is talking about the geography of Texas, which is a social studies standard. So you'll see the social studies expectations embedded into a reading prompt. You'll see science expectations also embedded into reading. So it's critical that our teachers are collaborating together across the content so we're not, we don't have silos of excellence. We have, we're, we're very good teachers, and, but we've got to make sure that there are no silos, even if they're silos of excellence. We've got to come together. So we went over many of them. There are more. <laughs> but if we look at, there's hot text. Hot text, the student must cite evidence by selecting highlighted text in the sentence paragraph or extended reading. We also have multi-part. I didn't give you a specific example, example of, but the student responds to a two-part question where parts A and B are scored separately. In many cases, part B asks the students to give evidence or explain their thinking to their answer in part A. So the depth and the complexity of these questions are more than what we have seen before. But yes, we are providing training, professional development, ongoing on depth and complexity to prepare our students, not just to take the test, but this is the type of response, critical response that we would expect of students that are making academic growth. This, these type of assessments, again, are aligned more, these type of assessment types are aligned more with how we question students in the classroom to really tap into critical thinking. So I guess the question that's been asked a couple times already, <laughs> are we ready for this? And I think, yes, we are. You know, we began online testing three years ago. 
Our district benchmarks and unit assessments already represent the redesigned blueprint and the new item types. Our content PLCs are increasingly collaborative. And the new state, uh, new state test question now matches how we question kids in the classroom. Uh, again, I think that the narrative of teaching to the test does not have as much weight. because That's not going to be possible with these new item types that I just showed you. So I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking um, the assessment, critical thinking, <clears throat> logic, comprehension, and all of it kind of being rooted in really good readers. And that may be an oversimplification, but I, I grew up in a house with a lot of reading, and my mom used to say, readers are leaders, which I've said to my children forever. And my thought is, and I'm sure you all have a brilliant plan on how this all gets you know, downloaded in the classroom and how we'll perform, but I just think we're going to knock it, knock it out of the park. As long, I mean, I know, great, and I, we've had this conversation, right? I don't expect maybe, I don't know, do we expect the A rating across the district? Can we say that's, we're going we're gonna to do it, despite that? But I, but I got this sense that reading is going to be a really big part of that starting way early on. Is that a, and writing, reading and writing. So if you recall, you asked when we t had the discussion about the requirement of speech right. being required, and I think I briefly responded, well, in the STAR redesign, you know, Readers are leaders, but readers are writers, and readers are speakers. We can't tap into this level of rigor unless our kids are speaking and writing and therefore reading. So reading, writing, and speaking are in the reading teaks. So I, my response a few months ago was we're not stopping public speaking at all. We're actually raising the bar, I think is what I said, and this is just an example how, because you cannot have responses to this level of rigor for ex the extended construction responses, the ex extended constructed re um, responses, or the other type without a student being able to speak and write <laughs> and read. Um. Hey, last, last question I got. In case the power goes off like uh, Tomball High School does occasionally during the year, um, the kids just start over again, or what's that procedure like? So we, we have uh, access to the testing application now, the format, it's auto-save. So I guess in any type of event, like, like right now, if you take the test and then leave it or turn your power, power off, it's auto-save at that point. Um, hopefully we have backup a generator so we're not completely offline, but the test, again, we're in our first <laughs> iteration of this. No promise. Um, I don't think that we're, we would lose information. Again, we've been testing for three years. We have had issues on star testing day in the past with um, power, um, but I think that our fiber optics are where they need to be. Our infrastructure is where it need to be, and we've tested it. Again, we've been doing this for three years. There are many districts that this will be the first time, not only to see the new items, but will be the first time that they will, their kids have ever taken an online test. And remember, we went online in the middle of COVID. So that was a decision that was made at that time because we knew that this was coming. It was important for me to have Dr. Webb talk about, you know, you've heard me talk about it is, it, it is not a different name, but it is a different test, right? It's not a, star redesign is, is not star. Good or bad, right or wrong, it's not. But it's important, as I've, I've mentioned it at times, I wanted you to be able to see some examples of what we're talking about. I believe our students will do very well. I've always believed our students will do very well. Um, I think there are some certain challenges, absolutely. Um, I am not against additional rigor. I am not against um, raising a bar. But I do, I, we at this point don't even have what the accountability will look like. So what would an A look like? What would, so on top of a new assessment, we have not completed exactly what you have to do to continue to be not only an A, but a straight A rated school district. We know it's not just about that. It is about the whole child. And I'm going to be transparent. My mother educator heart worries a little bit about students that may already have test anxiety and what will this now do? 
you may have students that have the ability to do well, but this may send them over the edge to some degree. I, I don't know that, but I would suspect the room full of counselors here would probably agree that for some kids, this is going to be, it was a lot for some of you just to see this. Imagine taking it as an elementary child. I'm all about accountability. I believe in it, I support it. I'm all about competitiveness and showing, you know, um, that we can do very well, but I'm first and foremost about kids. And so I'm not sure how this will ultimately fall out. We will see. But I do know that we have the best of the best um, to prepare our kids, to hold their hands if they need it, and to get us through star redesign. So one qualifying question and then a, an ask. Um, the star test that we took last yes, sir. was computer-based. Yes. So we have a precedent where, while it was 100% multiple choice, our, our students are prepared mm -hmm. but, but for that. Been. Yeah. We have been doing this yeah. to prepare them. So I think it may be our own middle-aged adult angst here about this <laughs> because I think our, our kiddos have been doing this for a while. So that's, that's a little bit how I the computer can feel better part, at ease about absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. The additional um, changes to it are slightly different yeah, understand. to do that on a computer. But again, we've never been a district to teach to a test. Right. We've never, you know, we are teaching, we are providing solid curriculum and delivering it in a, um, in, a, in I think a superb manner. And so I feel like the students, there will be students who struggle. We have students who struggle on the pro, all the prior tests we've taken. That, that won't go away. But we'll be here to support. So my ask, let me just finish John, on my ask. So I don't know how, Dr. Webb, you put this in a seven minute TED talk, but I feel like there's a lot of really important yeah. content. Educating parents on what a Be new so, test So you knew set. exactly where I was yeah. going. Yeah. I yeah. feel yeah. like there's something here that we need to get out sooner than later mm -hmm. that describes the, the, the best of what you talked about tonight. And, and, and my challenge would be, how do we communicate that so that parents are informed, guardians are informed, uh, and they're not walking into this because frankly, I didn't fully recall that we're talking about a star redesign this semester. And so the parent in me didn't remember that. And so if I'm not in tune, high, high chance probability your mainstream parents aren't either. So if you could possibly do that, that would be great. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's go back to the test anxiety piece for just a minute. I mean, right now for students who are identified with any type of test anxiety, then there's some type of accommodation made for them during the administration of the exam, right? We can extend the time, we can test in a smaller group, we can essentially pace the assessments so and they're not all seeing it at one time. They could come in, go out every half hour. Okay. Um, and, but the important thing is that we're doing that instructionally throughout mm. the school year because it creates more anxiety to, right. to bring these adjustments at the time of a high stakes test. So right. I feel very confident that any adjustments that are made for anxiety or adjustments that we've been making for that kid for the entire year, if not years. But we may end up having more students identify with test anxiety if this, uh, the, 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 the additional rigor or mm -hmm. the presentation of these different, uh, I, I know you say it's like what they're getting in the classroom and I could see that. Because, um, you know, when we've gone on boardwalks and that type thing, we've seen how the teachers are interacting and, and how they're requesting them write formulas or this type thing. So I get that, but um, and maybe Michael's right. Maybe it's more the uh, middle-aged that, that have some anxiety rather than just doing the, the multiple choice. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see if we do have additional test anxiety type of issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. This conversation will definitely continue as we move forward and learn how things go and what the actual accountability system ends up looking like. So, so I just want to make sure I'm digesting. Third graders type on keyboards whole sentences, right? I mean, that, that's happening. That's happening. Yeah. That didn't happen though when my kids were in third grade. No, no. probably You know not. what I mean? Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's all new to me. I'm not kidding. That's all new to me. And I know we've been taking the test, which is we've multiple only, choice, but like them typing sentences. We've only out. had Chromebooks for 
I know our IT directors here, but Chromebooks have been in existence. I'm going to be conserved seven years. Like that's that's as far back as so think do the math on that seven years ago, yeah. right? It didn't exist. None of this existed. Right, right, right. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Webb. Thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you, Mark, for your assistance as well. Item B, the next report we have is um, exciting. It is an update on our strategic plan. The work that we do each and every day is connected to our strategic plan. Anyone in our community, any parent, any staff member can always track the progress of our strategic plan on our website. We have our very own Dr. Amy Schindewolf, Chief of Staff, that will give us an update on our strategic plan. Good evening, President McLeod, Dr. Zamora, members of the board. Um, I come to you tonight with an update on um, Destination 2025, and we are at the end of Phase 2. So let me get this started. It seems so far away when we said it, when we created it. <laughs> I know. We said it's now going it's to be so, far away. <laughs> so a long five years, and it just, we are at the end of phase two out of three. And so if I take you back, we <coughs> concluded strategic plan 2020 and we initiated phase one in February of 2020. Wow. And then a lot happened. Yeah. Uh, we finished phase one in August of 2021. And that's the last time that I came to you with a board report. Um, you do see, uh, through the mid-year and end-of-year evaluation of the superintendent document, a full report on the strategic plan, but I come to the board um, in the report format at the end of each phase. And so, before we start and we go into talking about where we are in phase two, I always like to talk about the definitions because we've had to define these words a little bit on our own. And so when you see in the plan, the word complete or the green C, what that means is that the action step or strategy has been completed in full as detailed in the plan, or it has become routine action. And that's important to know because most of the items in the strategic plan that say complete are now routine action. It doesn't mean that we're not working on them, that we're not furthering them, that we're not progressing on that or have goals around that in the district. It just means that as detailed in the strategic plan and funded through the strategic plan, it is deemed complete. You will also see in progress, and that means that one or more of the action steps aligned to the strategy have been completed, but not all of them. And until all of the action steps that we've detailed we say are complete, I won't call that strategy complete. So sometimes we could have a phase one strategy that's still in progress. And it's just because it takes a long time to get it into routine action and it's all timed out. So I just wanted to um, note those two things. And I didn't put the detail um, for not started because that just means not started. But anything that is not started will be started in progress and complete in phase three. When we talk about the metrics of the strategic plan, it's important to note what we mean by that. We've had a lot of conversations around metrics in how do we measure the success of this? Um, and we do measure the success of strategies and action plans and goals through a variety of ways, through data, through appraisal documents, through our accountability system, but we don't necessarily tie a success measure to a strategy in the strategic plan. So if I say, going off Dr. Webb's um, and Mark's presentation, that, well, we have raised our reading third grade scores X percent. I can't necessarily say that is because of a strategy in the strategic plan, because when you look at the effect size of each strategy, we do a variety of things that raise reading scores in our district. And so 
when we look at the metrics of the strategic plan, it's really about the progress. It's really about how far are we to completion. And so that's what you will see the percentages throughout the plan. The overview of the plan, to take you back a little bit, is designed around eight priorities. Within each of those eight priorities, there are a number of strategies, goals, and strategies. So as a review, we have priority one, future ready learners, and there are three goals that are tied to that priority and 11 strategies. And you will see there how many we have complete and how many are in progress of those 11 strategies. And I do want to note that in your board backup, there is a document that goes through each strategy and tells you what phase and what form where we are in progress. So you can see the specifics behind those strategies. Priority two, responsive and personalized learning. Um, we have two goals and we have three complete, two in progress and one not started. Priority three, social, emotional and safety wel welfare of the whole child and priority four, technology and digital learning and you can see the progress of those as well in your document. Priority five is family and community alliance with two aligned goals. Priority six, quality staffing and professional learning. Priority seven, finance and facilities. And priority eight, communication and marketing. You will see that there are very few strategies when you look at the entire plan that are noted as not started. And so as we move into phase three, we will be focusing on the initiation of those and of the entire plan, there are only nine that we have not started. This is a screenshot from our website and we do keep up to date with the progress of our strategic plan on the website, but we note it by priority. We don't note it by, we don't put all the detail of each strategy and where we are, we just note the priority. So you can see there the progress of the overall priorities. When you go back in history, as we are currently at the conclusion of phase two, I want to note at this point that the important, I think one of the most important things to note in the success and progress of our strategic plan is the funding package. We often talk about um, districts that have strategic plans, but it doesn't have an aligned funding package. So I want to again express gratitude to the board for seeing that foresight, having that foresight and really standing behind the strategic plan of the district so that when we initiated this in 2020, you tied $4 million to it. And so at the end of each phase and year, we come and we say, this is how much we have spent and this is, we're on track. And so there's only one additional time that I will have to come to you in um, June and ask for funding for the next phase. And so we are on track with our funding package of that $4 million. And um, I am, it's probably um, very rare to hear this, but I do think that it, the strategic plan is maybe the only thing that inflation hasn't hit. And so in our district, so we are able to get it all done within that $4 million. Dr. Shindewal. Yes, sir. So don't necessarily need to answer it now, but I recognize we're on a five-year plan. Uh -huh. Some things are ahead of plan. Some things are on track. Some things maybe not started or maybe a little behind, Correct. right? Normal stuff. If there's a funding ask that allows us to land this sooner than five years, meaning can we accelerate? I'm, 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 I'm asking an unconstrained question. I'd ask that you consider that for things to accelerate that which is on track or things to accelerate that which is not started. Do you want to explain how that? I got a head nod already of no, but um, I'm, and I'm it's saying. It's not a no necessarily. It's <laughs> they were phased. It, well, it was a no. <laughs> it was because they were phased out uh, in a, in a, for the time frame in which everything needed. There was an immense amount of community, parents, sure. teachers, administrators sure. that came together. So to fast track something 
just to finish it to get that that complete wasn't the intention but but, um, but, but if there we have had to move things right. ahead of schedule because it made the most sense and i know you're going to share some examples of that and we have had to stop some things because of things that have happened because that made the most sense i just i, I realized that this plan was developed in you know 2020 right we're sitting in 2023 we've had covid we've had yeah. all of these events that have happened i'm just saying after you know hitting phase two here if there's an adjustment a different approach a funding ask bring it forth so that we can understand how we can help we can you and team happen. be more successful that's that's the point that. So well, I appreciate that. Well and also, um, in responding to what Dr. Z said, when we were in the phase of COVID, you know, I, I don't know if you recall, but in that board report, I talked to you about how because of COVID, we were able to expedite some of the things in our plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. An example of that would be the technology. We had to expedite the digital learning piece to get our students online when it was actually a phase later when we were initially planning it out in 2020. Correct. An example of something that I think that we um, are going slow to go fast, if that makes sense, and we're being very methodical, has to deal with a lot of our priority six and our quality staffing. Because there are a lot of things in there, I'm not talking about staffing the schools, but we have things in there about the development programs to, and that we want to create a three-year teacher program, a two-year administrator program, a paraprofessional program. And we've methodically put that into um, steps and phasing it sequentially because we feel like it will be more effective and that we'll have um, quality programs in that and we are getting really great feedback about our teacher mentor program onboarding and our administrator onboarding that we've put in. Um, so we are, I will say, I'm happy to report that when you look at our plan, we are completely on track. There is only, with the exception of one strategy within the plan that was designed to be in phase two that we have not started and it will move to phase three. And so you will see that noted in your plan and it has to do with facilities. And so that one, we did have eight slated for phase three and so that is our ninth. So as we move into phase three, we will focus on initiating those nine. As an overview of phase two, um, at the end of phase two, we had 39 strategies that were scheduled for phase one and phase two. If you recall, way back when, before COVID, we front-loaded the plan with a ton of strategies up front. Um, I think that that was just due to um, excitement and also because uh, 2025 was a strong continuation of our 2020. And so 83% of the total strategies were designed to be initiated in phase one and phase two. 36% of those 39 are complete, 62% are in progress, and that one, which is 3%, has not started, and so we will move that to phase three. Dr. Shinwolf, real, real quick, on your, your chart that you said is online uh, that shows the pr progress for each strategy, Yes. Um, do, you, do you give a certain um, ranking to your in progress in order to, to 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 get it there. I mean, how how are you aligning that? I mean, you, is there something subjective or is it very objective as to if it's completed, it's X, and if it's uh, in progress, it's Y. No matter where it is in the in progress. Are you talking about the percentages for complete? Yeah. So the charts you show that has sure. the, the eight so the way that I do that is um, it it's. Shinda Wolf statistics, I think. Okay. Um, but <laughs> it's worked well. <laughs> we've talked as a team, and the way that I do that is down to the action step. Okay. So when I look at a goal, and then it has a strategy 1.1, okay, there could be six action steps that as a team we have written that we will deem that once those six steps are complete, then that strategy is complete because it's become routine. So when I do the percentages, instead of doing the pri at the priority level or the strategy level, I take it to the action step level. Okay. 
to see if, because I deem, I would deem that the percentage towards completion is through the action step level. And then each action step has a value of one. Yes. That's kind of a next iteration of, if you recall, many of you were on the board, we had our first ever strategic plan, 2017, that we completed in under time, less than five years, we completed in 2020, hence the birth of this strategic plan. Right. And so part of that was learning from the metrics from that. Um, and to the point, I just wanna, I, I, I wanna, wanna go back, back to, to that too. one. I wanna go back to it too. I want to make sure that the board understands and I'm glad that Dr. Schindelwolf pointed this out because the team, Team Tomball, could not accomplish. We could have met endlessly as we did with community, parents, staff, students. We could not complete any of the strategic plans without the full support of this board and the funding because everybody knows a story from another district perhaps where something was written but not funded. It doesn't happen. So this board understood with 2017 and now 2025. Um, I have never felt like if suddenly because of inflation or something comes up that we will have to do without. Um, I, I have faith in the board and the system enough to say, look, we underestimated this, this has happened, we really need additional X, Y, Z to make it happen. Now I won't say we haven't gone to gym to try to figure something out or maybe move from this to cover that or something else is coming higher, something else is coming lower. So if we needed something right. or even still, let's say need something for full completion, as a superintendent, as a team, we will come back and say, we can't see this to completion and we will get it to completion and then we will plan what 2030 looks like. Sure. Right. What happens in the next five amazing years? Okay. Sorry. I, I would. I would. I would just like to add, if I may. So, <clears throat> what, what you articulated, right? The, the plan. We've got a funding plan. I recognize that that's built into Jim's financials. Right. Right. I recognize that going faster for faster sake doesn't always make sense. <coughs> but I also know that you are competitive. Just a we little. are an A-rated district. You're constantly raising the bar. Right. In my mind. If you finish a five-year plan in four oh. years, that is acceptable. Um, but let's not delay things because, right. well, we said it's a five-year plan. Right, this is right. what we told the community. Right. If, let's let's get on to the next five-year plan. Right. Now, and I actually think we would have completed this, and we still might sooner, but COVID, as we all know, did some things had to slow down because the first strategic plan, um, I don't know if it just wasn't robust enough, but it was our first, um, was completed. It was a five-year plan and we did it all in three years. But part of that was I way front loaded, you know, it was a lot. And I learned from that. See, I learned from that. <laughs> go slow to go fast. So we did like actually <laughs> discuss today that as we're coming towards the end of this, that we are in that last phase, that last 18 months as planned. And yes, you will hear again about the strategic plan um, tomorrow night, but then also again in August is when you will get that next update. And then we know that we have to start planning for what that looks like because we don't want there to be a gap and it takes several months to create a strategic plan right. and to get everything that we want in there in the community to get what they want in there because that's a huge piece. And so I do think that we can take a lot of time in developing what that next plan will look like um, by front loading that process. And so this is just the conclusion um, that it will run until the end of June or July 2024 is what it is planned to. However, it could conclude faster than that. Um, and we will be moving into the initiation of the last nine strategies and finishing the others that are in progress over the next 18 months. Do you have any other questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Schindelwolf. Appreciate that. Our final report for the evening is the instructional calendar for 2425. A reminder that as a district, we always uh, want to have a two year calendar. So, a special thanks to Karen Graves, our Director of Administrative Services, and um, everyone that was a part of the calendar committee. They put a lot of time and effort into this, looking at what others are doing in the neighboring districts throughout the state and ultimately what is best for Tomball, Tomball ISD and the academics overall of our students. So 
I will let you uh, make the further introductions. Good evening, um, President McLeod and Dr. Salazar Zamora, members of the board and cabinet. Happy to be here tonight with Caroline Fonseca, who is our parent, well, she's, sorry, our teacher representative from Creekside Park. I'm getting it, Creekside Forest Elementary School, and she's going to help me present the um, activities of the calendar committee for the 24-25 school calendar. And this is the first time, when we came to you last year, we gave you two calendars, if you recall, and then we'd wait a year and we'd come back two years later. This is, as uh, Dr. Salazar Zamora said, this is the first time that we've kind of, we're gonna do this every year and just keep two years ahead. And I think that that is going to help out a lot with some of our other departments, um, human talent, as, as they put work calendars together, and probably families as well to plan ahead for that. Okay, so. I, hold on, sorry, there we go. Okay, first of all, just wanna recognize the calendar committee. You can see the names up there, and if any of you are in the audience, just wave your hands, please. We do have a few, thank you so much. Um, I always have a great time with calendar committee, and they're always so dedicated to making sure that we put something together that's going to work for our community and for our students. So, You've seen some of this before. Um, our objective has not changed. We want to meet the need of all Tomball ISD stakeholders, our students, our faculty, our community. And um, at the center of all of that is the instructional needs for the districts. And so the committee is charged with the same directive, develop a calendar for Tomball that encompasses the following criteria, meets the requirements set by the state of Texas and the Board of Trustees for Tomball, and is also instructionally sound. So we have to begin with the state requirements, and um, those have not changed in a few years. A school district, according to the state, may not begin instruction for students before the fourth Monday in <coughs> August, unless the district operates a year-round system, and the state requires teacher contracts to be a minimum of 187 days, and we'll get into why we've changed a little bit from that in a minute. Other state requirements, um, 75,600 operational minutes are required for our students. It used to be um, days, 180 days, and then that changed to minutes. And uh, the state still currently offers us 2,100 waiver minutes for staff development days. And each district can choose how they want to apply those waiver minutes if they apply for them. And then, as you all know, you approved a District of Innovation plan for Tomball where we are, um, we don't have to adhere to that August start date. We, in our innovation plan, have our students beginning no earlier than the second Monday of August, and the teachers begin no earlier than the first Monday of August. So with that, the other committee considerations are we want to make sure we provide staff development throughout the school year. There are other districts who kind of stack it at the beginning of the year. Some of them put some of it at the end of the year. And we have um, felt that it's important based on feedback from teachers and staff and administrators that it's important to have that built in throughout the year. We want a calendar that has semesters that are somewhat similar in length maintain a familiar routine around testing time. Students do better that way. No holidays on the day before a state test. Provide a day before school starts for teachers to have classroom time. That's something that we've gotten a lot of feedback about. Finish instructional year before Memorial Day. That seems to be important to our community when we can do that. And um, we added last year another consideration since most districts have started giving election day off for safety reasons. The day before election day was also considered important because of attendance and you know, you give a Tuesday off, that Monday's just kind of hanging out there and just an excuse for a four day weekend for most people. So we just made it one. And then the last consideration was kind of added and we'll talk about that, we've had a lot of requests a lot of districts are giving an extended break in october so we kind of looked at what could we maybe do um, we opted not to go for a full week and we'll get a little more into that um, but we wanted to try to give a little something for the people that requested that okay so i'm going to let Ms. fonseca take it from there okay so then um, we sent out a survey to the community and the results of the survey are 
um, that 47% um, chose option calendar one and 53% chose um, calendar two. So then after that survey, we came back and met again and then just kind of talked about some other things that we needed to consider with if option two was the approved calendar, um, that the PSAT testing would occur on October 16th. So um, we don't want to have a holiday prior to that testing. So moving that staff day um, from October 15th to maybe um, October 10th. Yeah. Okay, so basically you can see the proposed calendar in front of you. The original one that the committee liked and that the, the community liked was what we called Plan 2 in the survey. And it was identical to what you see here, except for the, um, what you see for October 10th was originally October 15th. It was an afterthought when we realized, oh wait, <laughs> the PSAT is more than likely going to be on the 16th, that we thought, okay, we still, the community still seemed to like the idea of that longer weekend, so we then moved that day from Tuesday back to Thursday. So you still get that five-day weekend for students and their families and then um, but it's not going to interfere with the testing as much so that's pretty much what we ended up with and as far as um, other considerations the week in October we still do not as a committee did not feel that was instructionally sound and also the numerous participants that we have in extracurricular activities is very high in the fall and none of those people who are involved in extracurriculars would be able to take a full week off in October. So it would be kind of an uneven break, a little bit um, inequitable for our <coughs> staff that are involved with extracurriculars and our students. Karen, Any yeah, Karen, two questions on the considerations, and maybe I missed it, but two things that I'm used to seeing uh, for the considerations, at least the committee considerations, was. Um, something matching the collegiate calendar and secondly um, having the first semester in before the Christmas break so I didn't see those enumerated so if we had a change no 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 that's still a consideration sorry I just didn't include those just because we've been doing this like that for so many years I didn't I thought is kind of understood but I can keep those in there no no that's fine I just I just wanted to see no, if the committee had I noticed this calendar didn't change that but I didn't know if somehow there was a uh, a, a move towards those two not being this high? No, I think because really it, you'd be hard pressed to find a district. There are a few still that are hanging out there finishing in January, but, but when we first started putting that in there, there were still, when they moved the start date in August back, there were a lot of districts that said, hey, we're going to have to end first semester in January. And then it was important <coughs> for us to kind of explain why we still didn't want to do that. But now that the District of Innovation is around for most districts, most districts are finishing before January and so it's just I didn't feel it was as as necessary to explain why but we can still include that and then the collegiate thing that just as long as we finish before January we're in line with the collegiate calendar in okay. that respect okay great thanks thank you so Martha um, you and team this past year made a recommendation that we add more staff development days so our 22-23 calendar reflects that. Correct. I haven't had a chance to look at the 23-24 to see, did you roll that in there? Yes, sir. Does this calendar also encompass that? Yes, sir. Yes. So if we were to compare, is it just four more days? So, um, so this calendar compared no, to? No, I think it's, we, have the we added um, two this year, and then we kept those, and then we added them for next year, and they're included in here. Is it two or four? The half he's talking about the half days I just have I just have we added four professional development days as my sort of takeaway from the calendar adjustments is it just two half I, I think it, you might be and if this was a few years back we yeah. added in actually I believe three okay. professional development day the PLC days yep. So that was a while okay. back, and then after that, this we've last continued year, that. Okay. we added two more days for a campus days, not okay. necessarily um, staff development okay. days, but campus so days important. for teachers. Yeah. Yes. So the the difference be in summary between a staff development day and a campus day is what? Um, district staff development, where okay. we're doing district-wide PD, or campus where they're able to. 
be on their campus to do the work that they campus work they need to do. Is is the That's campus right. leader doing professional development on campus days, or is not that on the up to? Well, sometimes they do. So, but not always. It, it, sometimes we allow them the time yeah. they need for grading right. or to. So that was the original intent. We listened. Yes. To, or you listened yes. to the feedback, and that was, yeah. hey, I just need more time yes. to focus on maybe planning for a class, really grading. Heard that recently, this okay. last. Okay. Yes. last year and, and those are all still included okay. in, in this yeah. so then okay. th thank you for that so I want to come back to October mm -hmm. so I'm looking at the 10th the 11th and the 14th so those are student holidays but we're going to designate them as professional development days that that just feels kind of wonky to me that we're, we're rolling and then we sort of stop in October especially since you do have all of those fall activities going on. And so is that getting us the return that we're expecting when we think about how to effectively use the days? One of the things that we heard from the campuses, from the staff, was that they wanted to have some sort of break every month. Okay. They wanted to have some touch point, even if it was one or two days, every month where there was something different. Um, and that was part of that. We've always had a a little longer weekend in October okay. or have for the last several years that okay. I could think of. Okay. This just extended it by one more by day. By one day. Right. Okay. Yes. And that giving to those who said, well, there's a couple of districts in the Region 4 area that are giving a whole week, and I think that's been met with some success and some concern. Overall, that's not what the committee wanted to go with, but they gave a slight give with one more day. Right. Got it. And, and I think particularly I think good. Okay. since one of those is Klein, who's right next door to us, um, and we have a lot of teachers who have kids in that district, they, this will give them, if they have kids there, if they live there, they can have a little bit of time of that week. Because okay. we did have a lot of teachers who have kids in Klein that were asking for that week in October. So. Got it. We'll fit staff. So just one other, I can't differentiate between staff development and campus yeah. days. Is there a way to do this on like a board version of this calendar so that we could have some sense yes. of we'll what's the nuance? I'd like clearly. to understand it. Yeah. Okay. We can work and, on that. We can have that for tomorrow. And, we and I, can. And we can. Sometimes that'll change. Like we have some days. I, we, yeah, we can do that. We can do it based on how we've done it. And I would just time. like to wrap by saying I really appreciate ending the school year before Memorial Day. So thank you for listening the, and, the and committee, honoring that they, yeah. they get the credit yeah they, they, that's important to our community i think yeah. and sometimes it's not easy but they get us there every year thank almost you. every year thank you all right okay any other questions it seems like we're i think um, the only question i had just my, this might be a stupid one maybe just me or maybe just to tell the audience uh there's a lot of districts are going to the four day week so how do they get all that time in with four days are they going like till 5:30, or how they how they get that? So I anticipated why, why, why that question. Why are we question. not doing that? I, I, we didn't put it out there, but I anticipated that question. Um, I have several colleagues we know of people throughout the state. Not too many local tends to be smaller districts right now that are doing that. Um, everybody makes decisions for what is best for their district and their community. I'm going to tell you as an academic uh, superintendent, I, I'm just not. I don't see that as the best thing. Adding additional days, we have done it when we've needed to after a, a catastrophic weather event, after different things. But to say we're going to do that year long, um, I'm not, I am personally not there. Um, and I've talked to many others who, who share the same sentiment. I know some are doing it. I, I really haven't delved into it much. I think we'll hear more about it. If you're doing it for cost savings, everyone has different when we're all struggling, right, financially, I, I understand that. Academically, I struggle with that. I don't, I just do. I haven't been able to be um, shown how it is best for students. I always want to do things that are good for adults, but we are here for children. So. <laughs> but great question. I was ready for it. <laughs> all righty. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank we you. appreciate you. Great work. Okay, we have no uh, public comment uh, this evening, so we will move on to a review, an actual discussion, I will call it, um, of the business agenda for February 6th, 2023. Moving on with donations under consent agenda, we have two donations, one for Tomball Elementary School 
and one for Creekside Park Junior High School. And you do have the information um, so in your packet. One around question. Those. Yes, sir. On the Tomball Elementary School donation, are there any conditions, any uh, anything that this donor has specified as to there yes, are? Yes, that is for uh, to enhance the library. Okay. So to be utilized for the library. And we're comfortable that that which is donated follows our rubric oh, for library books? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, then we have a number of requests from Tomball High School and Tomball Memorial, and they are for different events for, stu for students to participate out of district field trips, for DECA International Career Development, both high schools, specifically Tomball Memorial, the Marine Corps Competition Drill, national championship and they did quite very very well yes and then the all service competition drill national championship as well as the ffa leadership conference so always excited to see our students be able to compete at the state and national level in so many areas so i'd like to just brag for a second please brag so, so lee <laughs> asked the question how did the tomball memorial marine corps competition drill meet go in allen high school um, there were two competitions. One was an armed division competition and another was an unarmed. And I watched it live stream. The, uh, and Tom Wall Memorial won the unarmed division of the Region 5 JROTC uh, competition. And they are progressing to now go to nationals, which I like the optimism that the school put forth because this required <laughs> this bet on the team to put this on the agenda item. And so I like the, uh, that. And so this is a big deal. So there are 17 to 19 students on the team, and um, their precision was pretty impressive. And so congratulations to that team. And I think the major is also anticipating that they win when they get to Virginia, because that then leads them to Daytona Beach, Florida. So we're betting on these kiddos, Putting and I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that they're going to be successful. As a former Marine, I appreciate well, so you. Well, uh, so just to continue, they won first place in the unarmed inspection. They won second place in the unarmed color guard, and they won first place in the unarmed regulation, Dr. Bailey. So congratulations to uh, those students and the, uh, the staff there. So thought I'd take a moment to brag. Thank you for that. We will have them up here at some point when their competition is complete so that we can recognize them. Moving on to the considered agenda. Um, as you heard, we talked about the instructional calendar, the importance of having um, two years in advance for parents and staff to know um, really what, what we're doing as far as what days we have off. And so that will come forward tomorrow for consideration. That is item A. Item B, C, D, E, and F. So the remainder of our items all involve um, bond or items for as part of growth. Harris County Flood Control Department contingencies um, water line easements, sanitary sewer line easements, and uh, additional equipment or supplies for our Pre-K Early Excellence Academy. I have asked Mr. Ross to discuss each of those in um, detail and any questions you might have. And then the final item for the evening, item G, uh, thankfully will be removed. Cool. All right. So, Mr. Ross, um, if you will uh, briefly discuss B, C, D, E, and F, and the board will follow up with any questions they might have. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, item B is exactly as it's written. It's a Harris County uh, Flood Control uh, Department impact fee. This is a new fee of $4,000 per acre for any new development, mm -hmm. and uh, that is beginning this year. They will not issue the site permit until they receive their money. It's $820,000. So I have to have your approval to issue that check, but we can't progress on that site without the site permit. So, so what are we getting for 4,000 an acre? Are we getting like some type of gold level engineering or are we just getting a, a, a money grab? It's going, we're actually writing the check to the Little Cypress Creek Frontier Program. It's for uh, some flood development, but also recreational parks and things of that nature. It's a, it's a funding mechanism for Harris County to use impact fees. So we have a choice of which items, or which, wh where we provide these fees to offset the impact? 
we don't have any choice at all in this matter as far as if we want a site permit to build on this site, we have to pay it. Um, and then who, who there's directs nothing it, uh, that is to little state. none of it comes back to us yeah yeah but who's and we don't it? have any say as far as what happens with the money it is turned over to harris county oh okay. i'm sorry i thought i heard you say it goes to little cypress something. that's the name of the program harris county has created in which these impact fees are being Elected. funneled into okay thank you hey. was that a a budgeted item is it it wasn't originally no. because we haven't we haven't had this impact it's fee new, at any time in the past uh, it's something that was new with this development hadn't seen it before is it because of where we're building or is it all of harris county it's it's harris county with their ability to hold us uh, hold our work off until we get a permit and we have no choice all commercial construction in harris county it's subject to that fee all developments is the way all it's stated so i'd say commercial too yeah there, everyone that uh starts to if they want a site permit to develop land in harris county and in this particular case it's this area it's the little cypress creek area <laughs> and that's the fee i don't know if the fees different in different locations or if there's no fees in other locations I simply know the impact of this. Wow. Was it planned on our part? No. So a uh, million dollars I wasn't expecting, or close, 820,000. Um, any other questions on that? Someone we could write our displeasure with that fee? Your, your commissioner, sir. Uh, yes, your commissioner would be the best uh, approach. Right. Uh, item C is a contingency amount of 300000 Last month, I brought to you uh, the um, development of the 205 acres in which the detention, storm, stormwater, all of that with uh, an award to Lonnie Lishka company for $3.9 million. Uh, at the bottom of that, when you saw the bids, it says, and that bid amount should include 300000 I left that amount out. I need that amount included in this, so I'm asking you to add it to the site development so that I can continue on with that. Um, but I can't, be, honestly, I can't begin any, any of that work until I get a site permit. Item D and E are both related to an August 2019 agreement with MUD 572. Uh, MUD 572 was formed right next to our complex at the Beckendorf complex and they are actually existing without any facilities as far as a water treatment plant or wastewater treatment plant and that agreement that we went in into in I believe it was August of 2019 we agreed to sell them connections and charge them fees and build a plant that would have the capacity to service them they're needing to tie into this in two other locations because what they're using with the allocations that they have right now is to tie in the 62 acres that has the 225 homes that's north of us. They're going to tie those into it. The uh, water, the, the easement for the water, I think that's just, that's a small connection, it's 10 by 20. And uh, it's just a space right next to our water line. So that they can come in and they can tie it. And there will be a valve and a meter that are installed there in which they have to maintain. We'll read the meter and charge them for the water. And that's what that first one is. And that's item B, uh, or excuse me, not B, D. D. Item E is the sanitary sewer. They're going to come down. They've uh, already purchased the easement from uh, Lone Star uh, College come down through the edge of their property and they will come in right next to our lift station and put in a small lift station to tie to us for their sanitary sewer. And then their lift station will collect at that point and then move into ours to go to the wastewater treatment plant. And that's, that's a little bit larger site. That one's a 30 by 65 site. Mm -hmm. But, um, those are the two easements that are requested with that. 
Um, any questions on it? So, Jim. Yes. I've always been a big fan of our revenue generating opportunities, and this has been a plan for some time now. We're, this is starting to get real with our connection points for water services and sewer services. Now I'm on the other side saying, as I reflect on some of our connections for some of our schools where we had low water pressure uh, and the, we were escalating to try and get the mud to add you know, capacity, the worry that I have on this side now is, now we're servicing a neighborhood of 576 homes and anybody else that now joins in on that connection while our priority all along has been the Beckendorf complex and what will be the West complex, are we adding any risk and in getting into the business of solving for water capacity and sewer capacity for non-school district entities? Well, if you'll remember, the, the, the 205 acres will have its own water treatment plant, yeah. which is water well. Yeah. And so that's the water. Okay. So you're going to have plenty of water pressure there. Uh, one of the concerns that I had was, would the pressure be sufficient to handle the fire suppression systems for the high school, yep. the elementary? Right. So that's why from the start we've put in a water treatment plant there. So it'll have its own water service. We built capacity in that original well to carry that, and we actually changed our opinion in visiting with uh, our discussions as far as the size of the campuses that we would actually need a well there to keep the pressure up, to make certain that we had. We looked at pumps and other, other things, but we thought the, the water treatment plant was best. So we've actually ended up with extra capacity right. for water. So um, this, uh, there's 225 homes that are coming in on that 62 acres. It's a Pulte home development that is north of us. But the other corners, all three corners that are south of us are also asking to be incorporated into MUD 572. And we have visited with them about uh, providing services to those locations. We also know what's planned on those locations and the amount of service that'd be required. And we measure it with, um, we call it ESFCs, uh, and that is just the estimated single family consumption and it's in gallons per day 300 gallons per day uh, we have enough capacity to carry this for quite some time because it doesn't develop overnight i mean it's it's gradual but there are apartment complexes going into uh, three of those locations uh, three corners and we know exactly what an apartment uses uh, well on average and the agreement that we have talked about as far as we would have to come back to this board with an additional an amendment to that agreement to add capacity but in that if we have to add to our wastewater treatment plant they have to pay for that okay. and uh, right now when they, whenever they tie into us they pay us a portion for us to recapture the cost that we have and it's a connection fee then they'll pay for the maintenance, a proportionate share of the maintenance, and a usage fee based on water readings, water meter readings. Is that all documented in all of this paperwork that, that we're moving forth on the agreement? It's in the agreement. Okay. As, as far You've as. You've already signed that agreement? Yes, in August of 19. Okay. We're looking at amending that to talk about if there's any expansion. What wasn't in there before was it had a fixed amount of ESFCs or gallons per day. And I just, I, I'm ruining the day when the HOA for whatever subdivisions are out there or the management company of the apartment complex or the owner of the Chick-fil-A or the Whataburger standing here at the dais complaining about low water pressure with the onus being on the school district to feed all of these non-public school district uh, entities. That's what I'm now on the other side of concerned about. Well, every, every mud district, uh, they have the same situation occurring for them. They have a board that's running that mud. They hire a company to, to handle that plant and to handle all of the servicing of that plant, the maintenance, any repairs, any calls as far as uh, needs. And we've already done that. And we're using a company that typically serves mud districts, and that's uh, USW. 
U.S. water. Uh, they handle a lot of um, their primary business is muds. Okay. So uh, that's how the mud district handles it, and that's exactly the way we've been handling it. So I should leave this conversation with high confidence. Yes. Okay. Right now it's in an early stage. This all won't happen overnight. This is right. just the connections to bring it in and to tie to it, to set up the meters to read as it leaves our lands, to uh, charge the, the mud district. Okay. And um, we'll go from there. Okay. The uh, last item there is item F, and that is uh, some final components as far as with the with the pre-K center, the Early Excellence Academy, and this is for the kitchen. Uh, you saw on the backup as far as the list of the equipment that was needed, it's steamers. Uh, one's a, um, there's two different types of steamers that are there, which are the $53,000 component of that. And then what we call softwares, that's silverware, bowls, things that they cook with, that's the $20,000. So that's the final request that I had as far as in this item is that purchased through a co-op yes yes by board uh, yes by board. we actually listed the bids uh, in your backup information exactly. we bid this through co-ops and three different bids through the co-op and you can see how they bid mm -hmm. and the buy board is something tied to TASB or there's some some service that they provide is that right yes, yes. with the buy board yes, yes. And making sure we have um, access to the lowest price point for the kinds of things we need in Correct. a bed. The buy board, and, uh, you've got uh, TASB that's, that's involved with the cooperative purchasing. You've got Region, region 4, 4 that is involved. You have other region service centers that are involved, and we're in their plans also. So that we have, uh, we've got seven different co-ops that we can go out to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ross. Appreciate it. Again, we did remove item G. So this concludes the considered agenda items for tomorrow evening. I will turn the meeting back over to President McLeod to end our meeting. There have been no one to sign up. No one has signed up to make comments this evening. Are there any comments to be made here tonight before we move into a special meeting? Any comments from the board? Yeah, I'll go ahead and go. I'll start off. Uh, for the football team, for Tomahawk High School, uh, coach was right. That first, that first game, uh, I was pretty um, bummed out. Um, uh, the, the, the other team scored a touchdown like the first 15 seconds. And I told somebody by me, this is going to be a really long year. I was happy that it, I was definitely wrong. It was a long year because we went to playoffs and all that good fun stuff. So I was glad I was wrong. But the first two games, yeah, I was I was saying, yeah, this, yeah, this is this is terrible. But uh, they brought it back. They won games um, in 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 spectacular fashion at some times. But uh, I was glad it was a long year since they. Uh, got pretty far into the um, season, and uh, I think for us here, as I don't know about y'all, but you know, winning games is good. It's great and it brings community together, and it solves a lot of problems when there's um, conflict. It always seems a winning team um, solves a lot of problems at the school with spirit and all the other fun stuff. But I think the best thing is the uh, academic side too, to where. You know, they are winning on the field and winning in the classroom. So hats off to all those guys and teachers and uh, tutors and any, anybody who helped those guys out and the rest of our kids to um, get them to that um, kind of grade point average. The only thing, you know, the one thing we, when they got those red helmets, the nice shiny ones, um, I was very tempted to, to get one and try to steal one, but I'm glad we did because I know they kept using them throughout the year. So. So whenever we get rid of them, you know, if I can get one, I'll sure, you know, I'll sure appreciate that. We'll make note of that. Yeah, I mean, it can be cracked too, you know. I, I don't need a real, you know, usable one. Just something to put on the, on the mantle with all my other LSU elements. 
So, um, you know, so to keep my collection going. Uh, the only thing I got a little bit of a bummer, um, I don't know, everybody knows uh, Eugene Hines. He was a great friend to the FFA program and also to the athletic program. He was there every game. He's, not too, uh, he's a 72 graduate, uh, but you can count on Eugene being at the football games and definitely at the act show. We saw him at the act show, and he had a tragic accident six months ago. Should have died then. And we, we saw him Saturday. I said, man, you are doing great. He said, yeah, I feel great too. And then he dies on Tuesday. So, um, so I just want to make sure everybody know, knew about that or if you didn't know, um, and, um, you know, kind of, you know, tragic but um you know great guy and did a lot of things for the community and for tomball high school especially to the ffa program so that's all i got i'll chime in real quick i mean matt brought mm -hmm. up the um the ffa uh program so uh what a great show we had um was able to spend some time out there um uh, really appreciate the efforts of of the high school staff um, our FFA teachers, our CTE um, uh, group. I mean, it's an all hands on effort, uh, but it was a great show. We had some great um, su uh, record successes uh, in the auction, uh, but uh, I think it was a good time had by all starting off with the, um, uh, the special needs rodeo. So, uh, and that, you know, such a, such a participatory type of event, right? We bring in so many different um, students and, and community members uh, with the FFA program. So really appreciate everybody's help and, and uh, work on that. The second thing uh, that I wanted to bring up was uh, over the past two months, I've had the uh, privilege to be able to be associated with two different reunions. Um, the um, Tomball High School football did a reunion um, and it was it was off campus, uh, but it was current uh, current and former coaches and then former uh, players. Uh, that was great. There were <laughs> there were individuals there who uh, were from the uh, I believe we went back as far as the 50s, and uh, then of course we had students who had just graduated and were home. It was over. It was in December, and so there were students who had graduated last year and we're back uh, home for Christmas. So that was really cool. And then Tomball High School girls basketball also did a reunion about two weeks ago. I was, uh, well, about 10 days ago, I yeah. guess. It was uh, during the, uh, the Friday the FFA show. And so that was really cool. That one we had participants back, I think, to the 60s. In fact, Eugene's sister was yeah, there, Dawn yeah, Miller. Was, yeah. And, um, uh, Matt was there as well because his sister is a former Tomball Cougar um, lady uh, basketball player. But it was uh, that was really cool. So um, I, I like the opportunity for us to be able to celebrate with our former students. Um, so I think it, it, it's evidently at least uh, something that got the got in the air of some of the Tomball High School um, coaches. And so I hope that maybe we see that spread out a little bit more. Um, that, that was really, really a neat experience. Okay, that's it. Anybody else? I don't know. Shout out to JD and that fine arts um, display at the Tomball Event Center. Great job again to the fine arts uh, program. A amazing display of, of uh, all sorts of uh, artists, uh, students that we've got. Uh, Lee and I actually did something fun. We went to Lakewood Elementary's first grade choir performance the other night and there were some songs that I had not sung in quite some time that uh, certainly lifted my spirit and I appreciated the, the great sense of humor uh, that also uh, uh, existed in a standing room only performance it was quite impressive yeah. um, and I'll, I'll end with um, uh, super impressed with the different Tomball High School versus Tomball Memorial High School sporting events that I've been to over the last I don't know, two or three weeks, um, uh, competitive, uh, but respectful. And I love that about, I'm not gonna call it a rivalry, but I love that about uh, both teams. And it's very different when you see these two teams, be it boys, girls, 
doesn't matter, um, be it soccer, basketball, what have you, against our other district rivals. It's more intense. Um, and so uh, there's a, uh, a wonderful spirit between those two high schools that I continue to enjoy uh, uh, seeing. And so that's an administrator thing, in my view, but it's also, I think, a representation of the spirit that starts early um, when we, when we uh, think about our feeder patterns and, and, and our, uh, our character strong and our, our education program. So I just want to acknowledge that. It's pretty special. Thank you. Um, on that note, I normally don't make comment, but could I have J.D. Yonda please stand up? Please stand up, Mr. Yonda. You're not in trouble. <laughs> This will be announced on Wednesday uh, publicly, but ladies and gentlemen, this is the TMEA State Director of Fine Arts of the Year for the State of Texas. Hey. Yeah. deal and I said oh it's a very big deal very very excited just had to uh, had to mention that I know this is board comment not superintendent comment so I will stop there <laughs> thank you that's marvelous that is. anybody else good you good well I got to go to the principal partners luncheon today John was there Mark Tina some of the some of the rest couldn't make it but what I heard from the parents that spoke just exudes the incredible work y'all are doing. I, I, I tend to get in a kind of a coach's mindset and get all fired up about pub ed, um, but there is reason to be excited about what you're doing. And if you ever need a pick me up, would you call me? Because <laughs> it is incredible the reports given today by parents who got to come on your campuses, walk around with you, see what you do, they were exuding the joys of having their kids in this district. And I'm just so very grateful, so glad to be here. Great team, it's really something. That's all I have. Anybody else? Okay. Is there a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. Motion made by Mr. McStravick, seconded by Mr. Scheel. All in favor? This meeting's adjourned. At 740. 740. At 740. Very good. Thank you.